thanks very much for coming and for, for your interest. Um, just to, to get a quick sense of the room, how many of you are here who were not at my talk yesterday? Okay, so several. Don't feel guilty. <laughs> that just gives me a perspective of where we're studying from. Um, okay, so I'm going to give a 30-second um, biography just so you have a sense of where I'm coming from. Um, I was, um, actually I got my PhD here at the University of Rochester in linguistics with um, work in cognitive science, so I'm a psycholinguist by training. Uh, then I took a faculty position at Brown University for about 12 years and then made quite a dramatic shift in my career. I left my academic position. Um, took up a very casual appointment at the University of Calgary and I spend most of my time now writing and editing. Um, much of my content is scientific in nature but not all of it so I kind of operate in scientific worlds but also in literary worlds as well. So my hope is to kind of bring you some of the things that I've learned from being a writer uh, into the discussion of how we might communicate about science for non-scientists. So there are a couple of things I'm not going to be able to provide for you today. Uh, it turns out actually that this is a really diverse group, both in terms of your backgrounds and your goals. So I realize that there's no way I'm going to be able to meet everybody's goals. Um, and I'm not going to be able to give you a lot in the sense of uh, concrete skills that you'll have mastered. Uh, we have a very short time together. So my hope is really to just kind of plant some thoughts give you a demonstrations of some of the kinds of techniques that you might use for thinking about your writing and analyzing your own writing. And then in the afternoon sessions, some starting points for uh, thinking about how you might be talking about science. Um, so one of the things I won't be able to do for you is discuss uh, good argumentation. Everything I'm going to be talking about is more from the perspective of stylistics. Um, so if you feel that you have issues with argumentation, that's not something I'm going to be help, able to help you with, but it is absolutely something that the Writing Center will be able to help you with. So I refer you there. There are many, many qualified people uh, to help you with that. OK, I'm going to start off um, just kind of pointing out some of the differences in language that we see between academic scientific writing that is for the community of scientists and writing that faces the public. Okay, so, so those of you who have been at my talk yesterday have seen this example. We'll look at it in a little bit more detail today. So just have a brief read through some of this text here. Can you all see it at the back? Okay. So I'm curious to know, what are your responses to this? How, do, how does it feel to read this? Anybody want to venture some thoughts? It sure does sound like my writing. <laughs> it sounds like what? My own writing. OK, yes, yes, OK. And what field are you in? Uh, computer science. OK, yeah. So how you react to it might depend on how close your field is to this. If you're very remote from it, it might feel less clear. I think to most people who are close to this field, it probably reads as perfectly clear, yes? To me, it's perfectly clear. I'm not a vision scientist, but I am a cognitive scientist. I have no trouble with this. But what I've done is compared this text to an example of an article that summarized uh, this article that appeared in Scientific American. So what happens if we try to describe this research now for a group of non-scientists? And that's what this text looks like. So how does this feel to you to read? Do you notice anything different? It's easier. OK. And it kind of puts it, um, I think it could make it uh, sound, it's more, it seems like it sounds more important. 
a little bit. I mean, oh, interesting. Um, okay. Uh, that I could, like, my mother could read this and mm -hmm. she would understand, okay. or she wouldn't have understood the previous one. Mm -hmm. All right. There's some really interesting um, things that are done here that I think are very considerate of the audience. So, for example, putting the phrase overlearning and competitor in quotes. Right? What does that do? Well, that signals to the audience, I'm not expecting you to know these terms. These are specialized terms. And that's a way of just acknowledging that we're going to use language that's a little bit specialized, but we'll put in a context that's more accessible. Um, so I think that's a very thoughtful touch. Uh, I think one of the problems that many people have when they approach academic language is they feel that there's a barrier that's been erected, that they're supposed to know stuff that they don't know that they're supposed to understand stuff that is not clear to them. Um, and nobody enjoys feeling stupid, right? I mean, that's, I think, one of the problems with communicating to non-scientists is we don't realize to what extent we might be sending that message inadvertently. So I'm going to just walk us through a couple of very detailed differences here. Um, if you were thinking of summarizing some of your own research, and making it more accessible in terms of its language to the public, where would you start? What would you do with it? What would you look for? There's a number of things that we can look for um, that just kind of highlight very concretely some of the differences. So let's look, for example, the number of verbs. If we pull out the number of verbs here marked in green in the academic uh, text, we have a total of 15. We have more of them in the non-academic text. Okay, so more of the communicative action here is being performed by verbs relative to nouns. We're going to count the nouns here. We've got 37. So we actually have um, slightly more here. It's a bit longer text. So we don't see a dramatic difference in terms of the number of that nouns, certainly the ratio of verbs to nouns we do. But what do you notice about these nouns that might be a little bit different from what you saw in the earlier text? Shorter. Okay, yeah, they're shorter. If we looked at how common they are, they're much more common uh, nouns. Yes, Marian? More of them are grounded with adjectives, like you always images for old TV. Okay, more, more visual, more concrete. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, if we look at the distinction between abstract versus concrete nouns, and here I've used kind of a, a generous notion of concreteness because subjects I count as concrete because you can poke them, but notice that they're subjects rather than people by virtue of an abstract relationship to something, right? So even the, even the one concrete noun here is, um, still has a level of abstraction to it. Very, very different if we look at this, right? Many, many more concrete, visual, sensory kinds of um, nouns going on. So that's one of the dramatic distinctions between academic and non-academic writing. Uh, what do you think that is? Anybody want to generate some hypotheses? The concrete is available to all. The concrete is available to all. Can you expand on that, maybe? Uh, they are things that are much more familiar to people. Mm -hmm. OK. And they're grounded in experiences that are kind of easy to comprehend, right? Um, the academic language uses abstract language that's been developed to have a very precise meaning that we understand, but that we've gone through kind of a communal process of defining for each other. Um, if you're coming in from outside of that community, you don't have access to that communal process of we're using this term to refer to this particular abstraction that has all kinds of details under it. Right? So we have to rely a lot more on these concrete terms. OK. You might have heard discussions of passive structures versus active structures. In academic language, you see much more uh, passive structure. I love the first sentence. We've got quite a pile up of them. We've got the uh, reduced. A relative clause conducted there in the passive form. Uh, later on, we have has been maximized and then is called overlearning, right? One sitting on top of the other. Uh, Whitney tells me that the number of passives really de kind of depends on the genre of writing, even within academia. So evidently in engineering, 
uh, people are exhorted to really, really use passives as much as possible because it has a somewhat distancing and depersonalizing effect. Right? So it's a way of communicating something about where we're kind of de-emphasizing the person who's doing these things and we're emphasizing the process or result that we're focusing on. So here we have 8 out of 11. If you look at the ratio of passives to actives in spoken language, this is huge. In spoken language, we get maybe 10 to 15% of passives to actives. And here in the non-academic version, we have many more actives relatives to passives. Okay, so these are some of the kinds of differences that you can look at. If you're thinking about taking some of your results and trying to communicate them to non-scientists, you can just kind of mechanically go through some of these. Uh, one exercise that I've given sometimes, we've got a little bit of a flicker issue. Uh, one exercise that I've given not to scientists but to creative writing students is that uh, you just kind of underline all your nouns and verbs and then you see if you can find a better one for it that suits your purpose more easily. Um, so one version of this exercise in a creative writing context might be I create a text where the nouns and verbs are fairly vague in general. So I might word, use a word like walk or hat or car and encourage students to create two versions of the text where they replace the nouns and verbs. So a hat might become a fedora or a baseball cap. A car might become a Ferrari or a Jeep. Walking might become loping or scurrying. Right? So you can create very different flavors of text. Um, in the same way, you can just kind of look through and see, can I use a more concrete way of stating this? Um, you know, is there a verb that I can substitute for a noun? What does that do to change the feeling of the text? So hopefully those are some techniques that you can um, kind of take away with you into your own writing and observations. Now, one of the things I want to emphasize that I don't advocate, um, some people argue that academics should be writing their journal articles in a non-academic style. I really don't believe in that because I think that the academic style actually is serving a useful purpose. Um, and to draw that conclusion, I, I'm thinking of research that's been done by linguists um, Doug Biber and Bethany Gray, where I talked about this a little bit yesterday. Uh, one of the big stylistic differences between academic and non-academic writing is what I think of as noun piles. So complex terms that refer to complex concepts where we're sticking nouns together. But notice that the relationships between the nouns are kind of implicit and reconstructed. So the versions on the right unpack the relationships between the nouns, um, make them a little bit clearer to an outsider. But you can see from this why that practice of noun piles might have evolved. Um, because we have much longer uh, explanations of text, right? So these become very, very efficient ways of referring to commonly used concepts. But they can be very impenetrable to outsiders, especially something like the post-training plastic state of learning, right? Or chick survival. Uh, you can infer what that might mean, but within a specific context, it might mean something very, very precise, like not just the extent to which sur chicks survive, but perhaps the extent to which chicks survive during a certain period. So we have this in cancer, right? Cancer survival rates typically imply we're talking about a five-year period, right? That's generally understood by the scientists in that community. So I really don't want you to take away from this that the academic style is a bad style and the non-academic style is a better style. I think it's more of an issue of you're talking to different audiences, right? So those of you who teach certainly have been forced to grapple with the fact that when you teach a graduate seminar, you're going to be using a different style of presentation than if you're teaching undergraduates. Right? So those kinds of adaptations is what I'm trying to get you to um, think about. Uh, let's do a little bit of an exercise. Let's do some translation. So get your writing pads out. I'm going to give you the academic version of the sentence. And let's see if you can turn it into more of a style that's not academic.
So you may find that when you're communicating to non-scientists that you want to be sensitive to meanings of words and their implications that maybe don't come up within a scientific context. So I'm really glad you caught that. So normal that might have the implication of better somehow or standard, right? Um, even within the scientific community, we kind of grapple with that. So what are alternative ways that you might express this notion instead of normal? What other words can you think of? Typical, typical yeah, most frequent, yeah, typical is, is one that's often used. Exactly. But yeah, that's another thing that is really valuable to do is when you kind of go through and underline your words is to consider are there some words that might be interpreted in a way that I really don't intend. Okay, so these are you know, some tools that you can take with you to uh, think about making your writing a little bit more accessible, breaking down some of those barriers that the language introduces. Um, and this kind of focuses on the process of translating your scientific writing into your other kind of writing. I find this actually really hard to do. So one of the interesting findings of Biber and Gray was that the style of language that is typical of academic writing um, is something that's learned. So when they looked at uh, students who entered the sciences as undergraduates, they found that they began to more and more closely approximate the style that was typical of their field over a four-year period. So the good news is that for those of you who are less experienced in science, you're going to have an easier time breaking away from some of these patterns and considering alternatives. For someone like me who was really steeped in it for decades, I still have an enormous difficulty. And often when I'm writing a piece for a non-scientist audience, I find that I get to a point where I might have done a beautiful lyrical introduction, I'm really happy with the language, and then I hit the part where I have to describe the experiment. And often my first attempt looks like the scientific writing, and then I have to go back and do this very conscious revision process. And I've learned not to panic when that happens, right? I, I know I'm unhappy with the language as I'm writing it, I know it's sounding not right, and then I go back and think, like, can I just change a word here? And often it's that, or adding a sentence to break up the density of the description, and that can have a huge impact on the flavor of the text. Uh, but one of the things I want to really prompt you to think about is that when you're thinking about how to communicate to non-scientists, I hate to break it to you, but you're probably not going to be able to just take your latest research results and continue to feed them out to the public and expect them to be enthralled, all right? <laughs> so there might be other things you, that you talk about other than your research results. You might be talking about other people's research in the context of yours or with respect to some issue. You might be talking about the process of science, which I think is really, really important. And for those of you who had time to work through some of the uh, readings that I suggested, uh, there's one example uh, of the physicist who was actually trained here in Rochester uh, where his description is not, a, not so much of the physics or the products of his research as his experience of the process of being a physicist and being trained as a graduate student. So I really want to kind of open up your thinking about what is relevant to other people about your experience as a scientist uh, and not simply thinking about this as a translation exercise. That can be very useful, right? It's certainly, I think, a very great skill to have. But I think there's a whole space of conversation that could be really enriched if scientists think about what is it about my experience that I can bring to other people. So some of the workshops in the smaller groups will really focus on getting you to think about what content you might want to be communicating to other people. Once you do that, once you kind of step into that zone, I think um, something that empowers your writing to a huge degree is the ability to infuse it with some individuality. Right? And this is something that's very distinct from what we're taught as scientific writers. We're taught to adopt a communal voice, and I think for some justification. Um, but if you want to think about connecting with readers outside of that community, you look at the kind of writing that exists in the non-scientific world. And 
its power derives very largely from the fact that it's really presenting a unique, specific human mind that thinks in a particular way, that expresses itself in a particular way. And not every reader is going to respond to that. Just like you don't love all the books that are out there, but you love some books, not just because of their topic, but maybe because of their voice or their approach, right? So you might think about, do you have favorite writers that you will pick up a book by them regardless of the topic? So that really kind of speaks to the fact that you're connecting with that mind and you want to learn more from that mind. So let's look a little bit at some examples of uh, still writing about science, but now that sort of steps out of this project of I'm translating the product of my research and doing something a little bit different. And we, what we're going to see is that the palette of options just really opens up. So it's not just more transparent versions of the academic writing. It's really a language that's infused with very different personalities. OK, so here's an excerpt from a piece that was written for the New York Times. So how do you find yourself responding to this? Yeah. It's comical. It's comical. OK. I noticed a lot of people smiling or chuckling. Yeah. It's also sad. OK. <laughs> all right. So we have humor, <laughs> sadness all at once, some complicated emotion. Anything else? Yeah. I appreciate the honesty. OK. That's interesting, because this has come up multiple times when I present this expert, excerpt. A lot of people comment on that. They, they feel that there's a sense of, I can trust the author because they're revealing some limitation. I think that's a really, really interesting lesson to take away from this, especially for us as scientists, is that we might often feel that it's very risky to reveal the limitations of our science in an honest way. But in fact, this does something quite positive. Rather than turning away from the writer, you feel you want to approach the writer. Yes, well, there was, yeah. It's interesting that it's basically negative emotion kind of as a quote, mm -hmm. which is really unusual. And I think that's why we're okay. also responding to the honesty. Yeah, OK. Yeah, yeah. Uh, notice how much it violates expectations, too, right? So the first sentence, <laughs> this article contains no useful information. <laughs> That violates your most basic <laughs> expectation about what an article will contain. And paradoxically, it hooks you in, right? It's like, oh, that's weird. So I'm going to read some more about that. OK, let's look at another example. How do you find yourself responding to this? It's exciting. OK. What is it about it, do you think, that makes it seem exciting? The sense of space and motion that it conveys. OK. So presumably, some of that's coming from the sensory language that's here. Yeah. Any other responses? Yeah, Wednesday. I find it very annoying. <laughs> OK, good. <laughs> what, what about it annoys you? Just using those weird, low frequency words to like, feel really fancy. <laughs> OK. Uh, All right. OK. So just out of curiosity, how many of you have a positive response to this? I do. I like it. How many of you have a negative response? I think it's understanding. OK. <laughs> All right. So uh, 
this is great because it really shows you that you're not going to resonate to all kinds of writing. And that's something to consider in developing your own style, right, is pay attention to the kinds of things you enjoy reading that says something about what draws you to it aesthetically. Uh, so I think this kind of aesthetic is very interesting because it's a way of creating community. Um, I should kind of clarify that when I say we're writing for a general audience, that's really a very bad way of phrasing it because we're not writing for everybody out there, right, out in the world. Really, we're writing for specific communities that we might have implicit in our minds, maybe that we haven't thought about, but that we just kind of, the, the writing is shaped towards some people, but not others. Um, and often those communities are created out of interest in a topic, but they can also be created out of aesthetic response. Right? So if you find your taste veers towards language like this, then language like this signals, I'm presenting this material to that community of people who enjoys this particular type of writing. That might not be you. Right? So do not attempt to write this way if you don't like it. <laughs> really find the things that you enjoy. Uh, were there other comments here? OK. Very different example. OK, what are your responses to this? Mm -hmm. It kind of draws you in. You want to know what happens next. Mm -hmm. It's like a mystery novel set up thing. OK. And what do you notice about the language? It's, it's like you're telling your friend that something happened and yeah. telling more about it. Yeah. So very different from the previous example. This is much closer to spoken language. And in fact, there's quite a lot of spoken language embedded into it. Right? It sort of feels much more intimately connected to the event as it's happening. Um, so this might be a style that fits your own preferences much more closely than some of the other examples we've seen. And if you've read through the entire piece, you can see that this writer actually does something really subtle and complex with language that on its surface looks quite simple. Right? So com complexity doesn't have to be conveyed just by the, um, the stylistics of the language. OK, one last example to look at. Any observations about this example? Mm -hmm. Sort of has a character with a lot of motivation to understand okay. where he's coming from and why he's biased in a certain direction. Yeah, okay. Do you have any responses to that 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 evokes? Okay. <laughs> okay. So it's a very interesting it's choice. My okay. Yeah. So this is a very interesting choice, right? These are the opening paragraphs of the uh, of the article, and the author has made a deliberate choice to choose a character that might not be sympathetic to many of the readers, and it's um, it's kind of an interesting twist on the hero story. Our hero is. Someone who wants to dominate the central nervous system, right? And then the whole article proceeds to talk about what's in his effect is the problem of placebo effect, where the placebo effect is unusually high in, with respect to certain medications, that it's a real challenge to demonstrate the efficacy of the, um, of the drug. And then that's the launching point for a really subtle and interesting unpacking of placebo effects. Uh, but yeah, there's something kind of uh, unexpected, an interesting twist here, uh, putting you in the perspective of the, of the protagonist here that might not be your traditional hero. Very much setting up the elements of a story, right? Immediately we know we're going to be drawn into some kind of a story. Right. So one of the things you're meant to notice from these examples is the sheer range of tools 
and techniques and approaches. Right? Some of them tell stories and establish characters. Some of them deal with abstractions, like that one about the infinities. It never goes down the path of any kind of a story, um, but it uses this kind of sensory evocative language as a way to hook the, uh, the audience in. Works for some people, doesn't work for other people. Again, the story approach might resonate for some people, might not for others. I think there is a tendency often for us to overestimate the degree to which story is something that people are really riveted by. I think there's a range. And you know, some people love stories, and that's a hook that really draws them in. And other people are like, meh. Like, I'm interested in things other than stories, and there are other ways of creating coherence that don't rely on stories. If we, I mean, we could spend a long time comparing the different styles here, but let me just give you a very, very coarse demonstration of the fact that what we see across these examples is a lot of variability in language. But even within each example, we see that the authors are relying on a variety of stylistic tools that they bring into their individual pieces. So whereas in an academic context, you're constrained to maintain a uniformity throughout of style. In um, some of these examples, we see some shifting in and out of formal styles. A formal sentence might be followed by a very informal colloquial one. Uh, one way to just very coarsely see this is um, look at the length of sentences that appear. So this comes from the academic version of the article. And we see that if we were to plot this throughout the entire article, we'd see something like this, that most of the sentences are within a particular length. The deviations are not that dramatic. But if we look at some of the examples we saw earlier, we see sentences that are single words. And some of them are very long. Some of them are very short. And that creates um, a break in pattern that on its own is kind of interesting. You're introducing rhythms. You're introducing um, you know, some expectations that you can violate, that some interest that's there just by virtue of the texture of the language. This is drawn from another example in the suggested readings. Again, you see quite a variety of different sentence structures. The opening sentence, water attracts trouble, a three-word sentence, right? a very striking sentence. OK, I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about this really, really big problem of how you get into your reader's head. All right? So that's one of the huge challenges any time you're stepping outside of your community. So this is a challenge that I think scientists face if they move outside of their discipline or and are talking to people, other scientists, even within, uh, with, outside of their immediate area of research. Um, so it, that problem gets much more challenging if you're moving out of the scientific context entirely. Um, in the workshops, we're going to spend a little bit of time thinking about who is your specific audience Right? So because we're not talking to the world at large. So we'll spend a little bit of time articulating that. Um, but here, just to give you a little feel for some of the things you're going to need to watch out for in anticipating, can my reader understand what I'm saying? Uh, I'm going to show you a little example that some of you may recognize as a classic psychology experiment, but hopefully some of you will not. So read through this paragraph. How does this seem to you? Can you understand it? Why not? Are there words that are giving you trouble? Can you understand other words? What's, what's causing the problem? Don't know what it's about. Don't know what it's about. <laughs> Why not? Sorry? OK, there's no And the problem is that the words are so vague, right? They can stand for, mm, you have no way of filling them in. Now, let's try this. Read it again. <laughs> Ma, 
magic, right? <laughs> All right, so this is a demonstration of how reliant we are on our background knowledge to give content to language, right? So uh, it's rarely the case that we fully specify everything. Uh, our choices of language rely on some implicit understanding of what I can figure the reader out will, will get for themselves, right? The, what they'll be able to draw out of it. Um, so, you know, this still is incomprehensible to people who have never done laundry. <laughs> and there are such people <laughs> in the world. Now, what I want to suggest is that the experience that you had without the title may be very similar to what a non-scientist experiences when they read this, okay? So, I mean, the words here are harder to understand, so sometimes they really pose a barrier. But even when you understand the words, you have a hard time figuring out, like imagining what is happening in the world that is linked to these words. So continuous training, we know that there's some kind of training that has happening somehow continuously, but what does that training look like? Uh, and what does it mean to be continuous? Are we talking about continuous over a period of months on a daily basis? Are we talking continuously within a five minute period? Right? That's, those are details that we're just not able to fill in. Or something like a visual task. Okay, very vague. <laughs> to vision scientists, they might already have a very elaborated sense of like, oh, okay, these are the standard visual tasks and I fill that in in that slot. So pay attention to this. And that's one of the difficulties with using abstract words is that often they come across as very vague even though you have a really specific meaning for them that is shared with other scientists. So, you know, make sure that you're not creating a doing laundry problem for people. You know, um, yeah. You were talking about also this, the academic, um, you know, less verbs. I also noticed that they, they aren't using a very variety of verbs. Like yes, that's right. A lot. Yeah, and, exactly. Um, and then um, I like the rewrite of having overlearning first. And I think it still mm -hmm. can work in that sentence because it feels mm -hmm. like the w main point of that was overlearning, mm -hmm. and then you don't get to it until the end of the first sentence if okay. you have all those yeah. other words you yeah. have to figure out. Yeah, so I think one benefit of doing this kind of exercise is that there are things that you can notice that you can bring back into your scientific writing, right? Because it forces you to be a little bit more deliberate about your language. You may find that it actually transfers back and that your scientific writing will change. Not that it will look like the non-scientific writing, but that you'll just be making more conscious choices because you're a little bit more aware. Um, I hear from a number of people when they start really paying attention to doing presentations, for example, to other scientists or other non-scientists, that they feel that their presentations within their own disciplines improves as well. Because they're, they're forced to think about how to structure the information in an understandable way, and that gives them ideas for a useful metaphor, for instance, that I might not be forced to think about if I can rely on this shared knowledge. So I think that's one of the real arguments to take some time and engage in this kind of work even if you don't see your career path as deviating dramatically from a traditional academic path, um, there, there are still very useful things you can take away from it. <laughs> OK. Um, so one of the things that you need to consider when putting yourself in the mind of the audience is this notion of what, how well are they able to fill in the content of the words. Then there's also the question of how well are they able to fill in the connections between sentences. So we do this all the time, right? We leave things implicit. If I say something like, Lorna learned that her husband Michael had an affair. She threw him out of the house, okay? Pretty easy to figure out what the relationship is. Uh, and the fact that we infer a natural relationship can be seen from um, the fact that it's, it feels a little redundant to say, Lorna learned that Michael had an affair. As a result, she threw him out of the house. OK, that feels like OK. It's a little bit excessive. I was able to figure that out on my own. And notice how surprised you are if you hear, Lorna threw Michael out of the house. Nevertheless, she threw him. So Lorna learned that Michael had an affair. Nevertheless, she threw him out of the house. All right? So this really runs counter to your cultural assumptions about 
the relationship between affairs and the state of a marriage uh, and causes you to generate all kinds of weird hypotheses about this. Uh, so your default is to rely on your background knowledge to fill in those connections. What happens if you don't have that background knowledge? So I want you to have a look at um, a piece of text that probably will not be very difficult for you to read. Okay? But anyway, I shouldn't, I shouldn't prime, prime you with any expectations. Just have a look at, at this text and read through it. So how do you find it? Yeah. I find the last sentence to be very effective. OK. 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 Does anyone find it difficult to read? Not particularly? OK, I want you to think about now, imagine that the reader is a high school student. OK? Do you think that there might be places where a high school student, and let's be more specific, maybe a high school student that comes from a disadvantaged background, where the background knowledge is less than what you have and less than what you might expect many high school students to have? Can you see places where they might be tripped up? Yeah. Like, okay. So I myself come from a um, you know, non-English speaking background. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I get the idea very easily. Yeah. Yeah, there are a few words uh, like uh, in the last, uh, second last sentence. Uh, proselytizing. proselytizing I, yeah. I have no idea what that okay. Means, uh, yeah. 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 So definitely, there are some vocabulary items. Let's leave vocabulary aside for the moment. So the vocabulary creates that problem of I've got just a placeholder in the sentence that's a black hole. I don't know what to do with it. Uh, but even if we assume that all of the words are comprehensible, are there some connections, some information you're filling in? Yes? I just imagine that um, a reader like the one that you described wouldn't necessarily have a sense of languages being spoken in different places or being bound by these kind of boundaries that are described, right. or even the languages themselves being, like I think for many of us in the room, we're like, oh, this is what they speak in which place. But yeah. Exactly. That yeah. Even yeah, exactly. So you'd have to have a sense of why was it that national borders and natural boundaries protected languages in the past, and why do they no longer protect languages? Right? Yes. And the, in the sentence that starts with the reach, where they're kind of mm -hmm. wide-spanning language, yeah. it, like they may not understand how small of a pocket of people speak right. the language. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Like, if you don't have a thought about yeah. it, like, oh yeah, that's a, a ton of people. Yeah. But they may not have a sense of which are the big languages, which are the, or which are the small languages. And look at the way that sentence is phrased. The reach of Mandarin and English and Russian and Hindi and Spanish and Arabic extends to every hamlet. Like literally, that could be interpreted as all of these languages march into every village <laughs> of the world, right? Obviously, that's not how we read that, but we're relying here on our knowledge of geography and the distribution of languages around the world. Yeah? I think even the last statement, the prosperity, it seems, speaks English is really assuming that people understand how language can really help you move forward in life, mm -hmm. which I think as a high schooler, I didn't have that concept okay. of how, like, how good your English yeah. can really guide the schools you can go to work. Yeah. Part of the world, like, which is something that you don't think about language as doing, and maybe that is exactly. not supposed to be its purpose, but it has become its purpose. Right. And what is the connection with television? Right. Why is the arrival of television <laughs> linked to prosperity and English? Right. So there's a lot of inferencing that has to happen here. Um, so this is a really useful exercise because for most of us, this text is not that difficult to understand. But if you want to kind of develop habits of seeing where connections might need to be made, um, it's kind of useful to take texts that you think are understandable and now take them apart and look at what information am I assuming that my reader, that the reader can have? And then 
transfer that to your own writing, right? So if you do those side by side, you're already going to be primed to think about the spaces in your own writing where you're making those assumptions. And then you can interrogate them and think about, oh, is this a justified assumption to make for this particular audience? Um, it's also, I think, I think, really useful in the context of debates about reading skills. So, um, you know, most of us, I think, would say that we would like high schoolers to be able to read a National Geographic magazine. Um, and if they can't, if they don't have the domain knowledge to do that, right, that can be a huge barrier to reading certain kinds of texts. All right, what have we got next? Okay, I'm going to skip through these. That's just another version of what we just did. I think we're getting a little bit close to the end here. Um, this is a slightly different um, issue that comes up again related to the question of getting in your reader's head. So have a read through this. How do you experience this text? Yes. Okay. Okay. Is there something specific that you can point to that? Um, just talking about um, this like a paragraph where some have knowledge of power and writing a lot mm -hmm. have that power, but mm -hmm. they kind of more traditions oral history. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 So it's got some of the same issues as before, but I want to draw your attention to uh, something very simple. Now read the version of text that has this. So the fix here is very easy, right? In the previous case, maybe we needed to insert some more sentences to bolster the connections. Here, what I've basically done is taken Jared Diamond's text, simply removed out the connecting cues. And in many cases, you can infer those connections, but it's probably more effortful. So I noticed looking at your faces, there, were, there was a lot of this going on. <laughs> concentration, right? This requires less concentration. So again, if you think of your audience and where they're at in terms of their background knowledge, the more background knowledge you have, the less dependent you're going to be on these explicit connecting phrases. Um, and um, if you have very little of it, then these can be very useful ways to guide your reader through the, the text. Jerry Diamond is an interesting author to read this way because he is the master of connecting phrases. Every time I look at his text, I see, oh yeah, yeah, this is very useful to take as text to show students how to write these transition phrases. Um, again, they come across as condescending if you know uh, your domain very, very well. But something to pay attention to as a tool at your disposal. OK, uh, one of my agendas, um, too, was to get you to think about um, a completely separate problem that comes up a lot for scientists who talk to non-scientists. And that is the problem of oversimplification, um, complexity, right? You're often taking really complex ideas and smooshing them or leaving lots of content out. Um, and this can be a real challenge to think about, am I doing this in a way that still does service to the science and its complexity and its unresolved issues and so on? So we don't have a lot of time. I'm going to just kind of throw out some ideas at you. And maybe we can continue this informally in discussions this evening um, and see what your thoughts are about it. But I'll just tell you what I do when I write myself. And I'm forced to uh, bring things down to a level of simplicity that I'm not entirely comfortable with as a scientist. I kind of work through this checklist that I have and just kind of examine the simplification. So. I think, OK, what's my motive for simplifying here? Right? So one of the worst motives, I think, is I'm in love with my story. And my story is just much prettier if I leave these details that I know are relevant out of the story. Right? But in some cases, maybe I'll conclude that my motives are 
well, I don't really need to flesh out this concept in detail. I just need to place it here so that the reader will understand something further downstream that I'm going to lay out in a lot more detail. So that's very similar to what you might be doing in teaching undergraduates, right? Like, OK, we can't get into all the details. We're going to first look at this. And then later on, maybe you'll have an opportunity to take it apart. Um, so question your motives. Um, what's the likelihood that the audience will draw a stronger conclusion than is warranted? Right? So if I don't qualify by saying something like that, and this is often um, comes up when I'm thinking about reporting results that rely on a very specific measure. Right? So maybe scores on a particular depression test that measures depression. Um, and of course, there will have been lots of discussion about whether this is the most appropriate way to test depression in this context. And can I substitute just people were more depressed you know, in lieu of laying out the specific measure that was used? Um, so one of the questions is, to what extent will they draw stronger conclusions? Or if I don't say anything specific about the size of the effect, and I just say one effect was larger than another. Will people assume, you know, you say, men um, do X more often than women. Are people likely to conclude that every man will do X and, women, and no woman will, right? So what is the strength of the conclusion? And that really requires you kind of stepping into a cultural context or into the context of your audience to try to guess what they might conclude from that. What are the consequences? So if you are trying to um, give people useful information that they need to make a medical decision, all right, that's a pretty big consequence of mis misleading your audience into thinking that an effect is stronger than it is or that a result is more certain than it is. But in some cases, I might just be wanting to plant an idea or spark their curiosity. Right? And I'm hoping that this will prompt them to go back to the literature and read more, or that they're going to read you know, another book on this topic. Then it's not so consequential if they've drawn a stronger conclusion. Uh, one of the things I think about is, what cues does my language provide about my commitment to specificity? So clearly, if you've been very, very specific throughout your text, and now you make a very general statement, that will be interpreted very differently. Um, right now, I'm working on um, a text that uses language in a very poetic, metaphorical way. Right? And I'm um, feeling that I'm less committed to specificity in this context, because the goal here is to create a certain kind of experience for the reader. And I've dropped lots of cues that this is not really a hard scientific text that they should be approaching from the perspective of, I'm drawing useful information that I need from this. Right? So it's sort of like if you, if you read a book that's surreal or watch a surreal movie, it's very rare that something really bizarre is going to happen immediately. Instead, you get these little subtle cues along the way that alert you to the fact that, OK, there's something a little off about this world. Right? So this often happens in science fiction movies. You, they establish a world that's similar to ours. Oh, there's something askew. And then the weirdness builds. Right? So if I've given my reader cues about the kind of text they're reading, <coughs> then that um, might lead me to make different decisions about specificity and uncertainty. And then, of course, there's the question of what remedies are available to you given the constraints of space. Sometimes you're tasked with writing a 700-word piece to describe a whole research agenda, and you simply don't have the space. Maybe the best you can do is to say something like, some scientists believe x as a signal of uncertainty, but you really don't have the space to go into any of the alternatives. So this is just time to kind of plant some thoughts into your mind. I'd be really curious to hear about any experiences you might have had of hitting up against similar conflicts. It's a constant struggle for scientists who are communicating to non-scientists. And one that you just kind of have to resolve case by case, I think. That brings us to the end of this session. So um, we'll see you in either the morning or afternoon session. And I'm hoping that you can also come this evening, that we have a chance to just kind of chat and talk about some of your goals and experiences. So thanks very much for coming.